Since Colorado was founded in 1876, it has been home to nearly 200 ski areas. Only about 30 of those ski areas are in operation today. The rest lay dormant, forgotten. Parts of lift towers and hints of old buildings now lost amongst the trees. Old ski runs left like scars on the mountains. Marks from another time. What was it like to ski these areas? What is their story? And what are they like today? We went out in search for these places, seeking answers to these questions. Join us as we explore The Abandoned. Geneva Basin opened the late season of 62-63. At that time, it was called Indian Head Ski Area. I was involved up there first in 1963 when it was Indian Head Mountain. I skied on the Junior Ski Patrol up there. Three or four years later, it was 66, the Burke family and Romers and another investor, uh, Ward Anthony. That's when we purchased that. And I bought Geneva Basin in October. And so, you know, decided, well, we're going to ski there this year somehow. So then I had to negotiate with the Forest Service, you know, on the lease, and they no way you can operate it this year. Every time they said no, I said, why not? And so when they told me why not, why well, then we solved that problem. And then those were the kind of things that we had to do, you know. Geneva Basin was just absolutely known as a customer-friendly family ski area. Generally speaking, we had skiing for just about any ability. Our first lift tickets we sold for $3.75. The best part was when they opened the lifts early and then you got to ski with a run or two before everyone else got up there. They'd start the lift, it was a uh, old diesel and that thing in hell. You know, find a big old black poof of smoke and then that old that chair lift and start moving. If that thing doesn't start, the ski area is not opening. When Geneva was being conceived, my father heard about it being in the planning stages and thought, well, that would be a good place for my son to work. And then they were working on the T-bar. It was close to the end of the day, and unfortunately, uh, my brother was tall and had on a ski parka, and his parka hood got caught in the cable. And that was very sad and very tragic. You know, and unfortunately, there's stories about being haunted and this and that and the other thing. And, you know, it was, it was a tragic death of a young man that was somebody's son. Even though my brother was killed there, we continued to appreciate the ski area. They built a lodge and they dedicated it to my brother and we thought that was very nice. I feel his spirit is always there, taken as a young person and somebody that loved the mountains. 1978, when we sold the ski area, then it lasted another four, maybe five years in one way or another after that. The Forest Service said, uh, we're not going to issue a permit anymore. And then it was sort of abandoned. It was really sad when they decided to burn the lodge down. I was broken hearted, <laughs> you know, because when everybody said it wouldn't work and everything, we made a, you know, we made something out of it that many people enjoyed. Yeah, I love that little scare. And I, you know, one of these days I want to, you know, do like you guys, hike up the thing and ski it.
Birth of Pass was um, at one time the busiest ski area in all of Colorado. I mean, that place was packed. It got started in 1937 as an officially organized ski area when the May Company donated a ski rope tow there. And that was the first rope tow in Colorado. It was around 1950 that Sterling Huntington came in to Bertha Pass and he installed the nation's very first double chair ski lift at Bertha Pass. So Bertha Pass has this double chair lift and, and that allows it to really increase uphill capacity far more than, than Winter Park could do at the time because Winter Park just had T-bars and Aspen had the single chair lift. In the 60s, things start to change because you start getting, well, Vail. Vail changes the face of Colorado skiing. A lot of areas open in 1964. They start drawing away from Birth and Pass at that time. All of a sudden, you're getting better roads to access these places. What really hit Birth and Pass hard was the opening of the Eisenhower Tunnel and I-70. That really affects Birth and Pass, but they keep going. And in the 80s, they do the most remarkable thing ever for a ski area, and that's that they allow snowboarders. That was one of the greatest things they ever did. And so the snowboarding world, all of a sudden, is focused on Birth and Pass. And you get people like Sims up there, and Burden up there, and you know, these guys are coming there, and they're showing off their new snowboards. It's almost like this punk rock culture going on. Bertha was a unique place. It, it was uh, a diamond in the rough, and there was snow making every day. Mother Nature. <laughs> we, we didn't need artificial machine-made snow. On routine, we would ski knee-deep to thigh-deep. We would have snow just about every day. Floral Park, which is on the east, is probably, I'm um, giving myself goosebumps. I was, in, I'm six foot four. I was in chest deep powder, the best run of my life. Bertha Pass is on the Continental Divide, so you get the storms coming from the west and the storms coming from the east, and the quality of the powder blower. I live in a nameless town. No need to wander I live in a nameless town. Black Many friends have said goodbye. Leave me. 
go to Bertha, it, it, it does something to you. You ski it just once and you're hooked. So I took it personally, basically when Bertha Pass closed. When it closed, that's when I retired from patrolling. I had put in 25 years at that time. It ripped my heart out. I, it was just, I, it was like losing a child, like losing your best buddy. It was a family area, it was, direct family and it was the Berthet family. So it was just a superb area. We all were sitting there and watching them. The crane came in and knocked it down. And that, that tugged on some heartstrings, but the biggest one was watching them pull the lifts out. Grown men were crying. A couple of patrollers that were at the area that helped close it started Friends of Bertha Pass because again, Bertha is all avalanche shoots. Friends of Bertha Pass is a uh, nonprofit grassroots avalanche education group. It originally started in 2003 when the ski area closed for the last time. The original mission was access advocacy to make sure that the area stayed open for winter recreation. You know, after the access was maintained, it quickly became a education group. We provide free avalanche awareness classes. It's not a level one or a level two. It is a awesome prep for a level one or just a good refresher. If you've already taken a level one or level two and you just you know, want to come to the classroom session. I think Berthoud Pass gets, gets more traffic and use today as a backcountry area than it did as a resort. <laughs> Berthoud Pass totally sucks. Don't ski there, it never snows there, just stay away. <laughs> In 81, and that's when Panadero came into play and it struggled, but we had a lot of fun and it, it would have helped this community so much if it could have stayed open. Well, the hype around town about building the ski area was really very positive. Everyone was very positive. We were excited. The first time I saw this place, I was sold. Even since being a little kid, I loved the place. And then when they, when they decided to do the ski area up here, it was like, oh, this is going to be magical. But the runs they had were really fun runs. It was really exciting to see what was going on. That went right under the chairlift. It had some pretty nice faces and then you could go out and then you could, so you could just do these huge GS turns all the way down the mountain. I would say Diablo, which is the expert run on the one side, and the back bowls were the funnest part up here. The back bowls almost always have snow in them. One year we took the kids' ski team up there and they talked us into taking them in the back bowls, but the snow was all over their heads, so we had to ski them out one at a time on our shoulders. People that started the ski area in 1982 were pretty gung-ho and hands-on people. Almost all the owners after that, uh, most of them didn't know anything about the ski business, and so we were just pawns working for them. You, you did absolutely everything. It's not like Vale or Aspen or a big ski area. You went up there at five o'clock in the morning and if you hadn't been up there all night making snow and fixing machines and equipment, and then you'd ski all the runs in the morning to make sure that they were ready to go. And then you'd go down and sell tickets and then you'd run the lifts. And then you'd be a ski patrolman and a ski instructor. You did absolutely everything. Under the last owner, they actually skied 30,000 skiers one year. And we always thought that break-even was about 40,000 skiers. But there were a lot of years when we skied eight and 10,000 skiers. We had this adventurous type of spirit that took hold of us. And we took our kids out of school and we drove out here and we, we opened three shops at the base area. 
four partners started the resort, not one of them had resort experience. You can't operate a ski resort if you don't understand what res resort business is. It dawned on me that, you know, God, we went through Christmas and there weren't very many skiers here. Now, I'm not sure we can survive financially here. Gosh, when the ski season's over, nobody's gonna come here. So I might ought to start looking for other things to do. We lost every penny we ever had in that ski area. We <laughs> gave our house away uh, to avoid bankruptcy. <laughs> Even though things didn't turn out exactly the way we planned, it, it has been a marvelous adventure and I wouldn't trade it for anything. And we always thought we'd get a fantastic person in there that would run it forever and it just never happened. early years of the scary was the most fun because we had snow then. And we've had years, you know, now and then that had great snow. It just isn't consistent year after year after year down here in southern Colorado. They call this a ghost town if I had no other reason to believe in global warming, I, I would believe because it is so different than when we came here. There's no question in my mind that we are getting much warmer and less snow. I can remember getting a 48 inch snow up at the ski resort. I'm guessing this year is going to be the worst since they started keeping track. We finally got the Kuchera Foundation uh, convinced that they should uh, put up the money to buy what was left of the resort at tax sales. They've appointed nine of us to be part of the committee to help run the ski resort since we're a little tiny county. Our plans are to put educational uh, programs up there, have classrooms for kids, to have the small lift open. Uh, next ski season and the small snowmaking system so all the kids in the valley can ski. We sort of see it as a training area for bigger ski resorts. To let kids uh, ski here and very inexpensively. It's just great to see when, when you, somebody says, you know what, I'm going to do this, what the hell. I'm starting to believe. I really am. I, I'm starting to believe. There are still over a hundred lost ski areas in Colorado. Every day, they fade more and more into the mountainside. And with them, an infinite amount of stories and memories are lost too. We set out with a purpose, to ski back country lines and maybe learn a thing or two along the way. Instead, we live vicariously through the stories of those who skied before us. And just like that, these places felt alive once again, and we found a new love for skiing. But it was a nostalgic kind of love. We found that unlike today, in a world of mega resorts 
and $200 lift tickets. That skiing once revolved around people instead of profits. That skiing was not just a sport, but a way of life. That the snow that once was deep and the winters that once were cold are now threatened by man's effect on our climate. Naively, we thought skiing would be a part of our lives forever, but now we can't be so sure. At least we were able to experience the rush of the downhill, the sweet embrace of the mountains, and the kiss of snowflakes on our cheeks. We realized nothing done with love can ever truly be lost, and maybe, just maybe, these places may never be forgotten. Welcome winter time, Stoke is on the climb. Hiking through the sunshine and the wind. The pitch is super steep, the snow is nipple deep. But there's the summit and I'm closing in. More snow upon the ridge line.